Everybody, welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. <laughs> Jumped, I, just, I, t- I dial right we're into real, it. We're real Paul. cinephiles here. We're here. Yeah. We're uh, we're here. I'm here with Paul Haynes. Hi. Hi, Paul. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thanks. It's good to be here. This is this. You come. You come. Highly recommended uh-huh. from uh, our mutual you, friend Eli Olsberg. Yep. And I. I can tell that you actually are like a real cinephile mm-hmm. because you told me a movie. That I think maybe ten percent of this podcast audience will have ever heard of. Uh, yeah, and that's a generous, generous estimation. This is say. a this is a movie. It's also I think the longest title we've had on the show so far. It's called "The Heart Is Deceitful Above All Things." Yeah. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot going on in this movie. Yeah. This if you if you nothing good nothing, nothing good, good going on in this movie. If you don't know this movie, and you probably don't, as I did not, uh, it is a 2004 drama film, co-written and directed by Asia Argento, starring Asia Argento, Jimmy Bennett, Dylan and Cole Sprouse, and it's based on J T Leroy's novel of the same name. Uh, concerns a tattered relationship between Sarah, a drug addict, and her young son, Jeremiah. A tattered relationship. Tattered it's relationship. Very euphemistic. Very, yeah. it's, it's very, uh, that's a that's a real, like, probably the nicest way they can put right. what happens yeah. in this movie. Yeah, I mean, it's, Wikipedia is supposed to be objective, so I guess they're, I guess they're the editors are upholding that standard. I uh, I did, yeah, I mean, I, I was not even about this movie, but I was on, because uh, of all the Jeffrey Epstein news that came right, out, yeah. I looked up his page and then his uh, uh, his alleged uh, madam's page, uh-huh. and somebody had edited it to say like she's uh, Jeffrey Epstein's madam mm-hmm. for all the yeah. for all the underage girls. Yeah, and then I checked back today and it, and it had been taken off. Uh-huh. Of course, Wikipedia is it's on like it. Max Landis's uh, social media went dark immediately. Oh, of course, the day it did. of that. And it hadn't previously because the previous one didn't make big enough a ripple. Yeah, I remember um, that. That was about uh, a year and change ago because I remember talking about that when this podcast was was first getting going about the initial like the that was right around the time and it because because it wasn't even it didn't get listed on anything that was like a big time mm. you know like Daily Beast or Newsweek right. or anything the way that all the other sure. stories had yeah but yeah so this is all, all this Mox Landa stuff now I'm so glad that it's finally come to roost yeah. this is Edgar by the way hi Edgar Edgar is a very he's going to help us uh, hello Edgar deal with the the trauma from yeah. watching this movie and and speaking of the Me Too movement which uh, I agree, it's hard to avoid talking about it these days. Uh, the director of Hardest Deceitful above all things is Asia Argento, who right. was on both sides of the Me Too. Yeah, it really yeah. complicates this movie. Yeah, absolutely. Because the movie is about it's about abuse. Yeah, to, from top to bottom. Sure, you can't avoid it. And watching the film, seeing that there's two there are two ch- ch- child actors used in the film, mm-hmm. and particularly the younger one, Jimmy Bennett, mm-hmm. um, what he's asked asked to do in that film. Um, it, it feels like it crosses an ethical line at times. Right. And, you know, Azure Argento has been accused of having sex with him, not during production, obviously, he was nine years old, right. but years later when he was still a minor, it, it's 17 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then she or her publicist alleged that he had sexually attacked her. Um, so... Um, ba- like some of her correspondence with uh, a confidential source had been leaked, and uh, she had admitted having sex with him. Right, and it didn't sound like she was portraying it as a sexual attack. Um, you know, Ar- Ar- Argento, Ozzy Argento uh, was um, notably, I'm sure you know, a lot of your listeners know, was one of the Harvey Weinstein accusers. Right, and one of the with one of the the loudest accusers. Right. she came out very yeah. early. And she really, really was was ardent in making sure that people knew what he was doing. Right. And in her first film, Scarlet Diva, is her first feature. I believe it's her first feature. She did some shorts and I think a documentary uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, that's her first feature, Scarlet um, Diva. There's a scene that essentially just depicts her attack 
uh, by Harvey Weinstein. There's another scene in which she's attacked by a filmmaker that I, I believe is intended to represent uh, Abel Ferrara. Okay. Um, in, in whose film, Nero's Hotel, she appeared. And I think she also did a documentary about their relationship, a short documentary in the late 90s. So mm. uh, their relationship may, may have... Um, continued beyond the initial uh, encounter that she depicts, but the same was the case with Weinstein. And the same right. was the case with Weinstein and a lot of his other victims. Right. Um, he was just someone who was so ubiquitous in the industry that it was impossible to avoid him and still have a career. Right. If he hadn't already made attempts to destroy it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, uh, when when you'd asked me to do this podcast, I wasn't sure what movie I wanted to choose. I, I, I thought maybe I would choose a movie that um, is popular, um, but that I'm just a, a, in a small minority of dissenters. Right. I, I considered Harold Maude. I considered I considered all that jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I felt like maybe I couldn't speak about those at length. And Hardest Deceitful Above All Things is a film that when I first watched it, I so hated it. I had such a visceral reaction to it. And that's the intent. I mean, she's, she's intending to um, invoke something Thing. It's a disturbing film, right? Uh, it's unremitting, um, but you know it, the the attitude behind the film and the I, what I felt like were the director's uh, intentions and motivations. I thought were not pure. Mm-hmm. It felt like a vanity project. Uh, it felt like a film that um, was a was a. Uh, a hipster product. Yeah. You know, Lydia Lunch is in it. Marilyn Manson is in it. Mm-hmm. Winona Ryder's in it. It has this kind of hipster cred built into it. Right. And it just, it, it felt disingenuous and it felt um, that the driving force was Ozzy Argento's narcissism. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of move. There's a lot of parts in this movie where they talk about her character's aesthetic being sort of this, like she knows she loves punk yeah. rock and this felt kind of like her trying to make a sort of sure. punk rock. Right family movie yeah and just completely whiffing just completely missing the mark sure and the other i think there's another really interesting layer to this movie feeling so false Mm -hmm. and feeling like such a, a a gigantic misfire yeah and a vanity project is that it is based on the novel by J.T. Leroy, who we have come to find out yeah. over the course of the past couple of years, was also a created literary right. persona. A, a, some would say, some would say, merely a pen name. Mm-hmm. Some would say a fraud or a hoax. Right. Um, so, I, and I, there was a documentary in 2016 called Author, mm-hmm. the J.T. Leroy story, um, and it's really fascinating, and it it really explores the um, the the right that that uh, Laura Albert, who created this this imaginary author had or didn't have to engage in this or perpetrate this this sham. I mean, she pulled right. the wool over a lot of people's eyes, but it was coming from a place of of trauma that she had experienced, not to the degree that J.T. Leroy experiences in in, in the works, right? Um, but it was a way of her working through that. And so, I, I mean, you know, it, it's I think Ozzy Argento also is a damaged person. That that may be what drew her to the material. Mm-hmm. Um, but being a damaged person, uh, thought I'd accidentally turned the mic. Oh no, you're good. Um, <laughs> it, being a damaged person, I, I think uh, only excuses so much. Right. And um, looking at, I haven't read the books, but the film, it it just it's stylized in a way that she's showcasing her. Um, aesthetic versatility and it feels to me it feels a derivative of natural born killers to some extent but what's also offensive about the film is that Az Argento is you know, in spite of what um, she may have lacked in her childhood um, I, she's not close with her her father is Dario Argento right, um, famous uh, Italian, Italian filmmaker, filmmaker. Yeah. filmmaker he made uh, Suspiria. Suspiria and uh, he, he's still alive he's still making movies right right but and, yeah and so she is of wealth and privilege and she is depicting um her how she sees American white trash Mm -hmm. and it's it's a caricature from the outset because she not only uh, directs and 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 I think uh, co-writes the film um, but she stars in it right Uh, she stars in it as um, JT Leroy's abusive mother Sarah um, who is a truck stop prostitute um, who has a string of boyfriends, most of whom uh, sexually abuse the kid. Right. And, uh, you know, I remember watching the special features on the DVD, 
And there's like you an, had the DVD of this. I I had the DVD of this back in 2016. Oh man! Uh, I think maybe I burnt it or used it as a coaster. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember what what fate ultimately befell it. A but fitting end. A fitting end indeed. And I remember watching the one of the bonus features was um, the footage of like the uh, the after party or the premiere and the after party, and just the tone of of celebration and self congratulation felt so um, just deeply offensive given given the fact that I think it had already come out at that point that. Uh, JT Leroy was non-existent, mm-hmm. and I, the way that the and I, you know I, it's that's the way the industry works. I, I think they were uh, embracing it in a way that you could see through it, and you could see they were really concerned um, about uh, its potential impact in the film. Uh, I don't think the film would have would have made money either way, right? Um, but there's a, there's a Mick Rock who's a you know a celebrated photographer of uh, you know uh, rock, rock and pop music figures. Um, he, he he's interviewed. He says something like, um, oh, I thought the movie was harrowing. I just kept thinking, oh, no, the little bugger's going to get fucked again. And there's this this trivialization of yeah. just really... And here's the thing. I mean, look, I think no subject matter is off limits to satire and humor and to right. horror. There's a way to approach it. And I think the way to approach it is to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and so, I mean, I'm sensitive about child abuse because I had an abusive mother, not to the extent that this you know fictional mother is abusive but it's something that i'm sensitized to you know i i dated someone um as a little bit of a tangent i dated someone who had metastatic breast cancer okay and she was not a fan of norm mcdonald and i remember trying to turn her on to norm mcdonald and so i i sought high and low for this special uh, that he did called me doing stand up that had been on netflix and that was removed so i had to like scour torrent sites mm-hmm. don't come after me please it's okay i am a, <laughs> i am a noted torrenter of movies mm. on this podcast so if anybody All right. they can sell sell me up the river don't okay. go to paul come All right. to me thank you <laughs> um so um uh i so i found i found me doing stand up on torrent site and i started playing it and I, i'd forgotten some of the material and like 10 minutes in, he starts doing material about cancer mm. and, and she wasn't laughing. And I thought, well, this is really, now I feel bad and this is uncomfortable. Um, should I shut it off? Would it be more awkward if I acknowledged it or just hopefully, you know, he'll power through the material and move, material and move on to something else. But right. then he, there was this line where it's like, yeah, you're uh, three. They, they lost their brave battle with cancer. Oh, it's such a brave battle, but they lost it, you know? And, and that's, she just left the room and went to the bathroom and, and started crying. And I felt, <sighs> I felt horrible, Ugh. you know? And so I don't, I, I don't, I'm not affected by cancer. I'm more so now having, having known her, but, right. um, you know, the same way that she's sensitized to that material, I'm, I'm more sensitized to child abuse. All that said, uh, I mean, one of my favorite onion headlines, you know, oftentimes though, it, it, and they mostly do it on social media now. They'll just have the headline without the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, you know, used to do that in the print. Maybe they still do. I don't know. I don't look at their print, their print. Uh, I haven't editions. seen a print edition of the onion yeah. in years, but there's like, you know, they'll have just a headline. Right. And one of my favorite ones was pederast judge tries 11 year old as adult. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, look, it's it, it's funny. It's funny, uh, and, but and there's no there's but there's no deception around what what the onion is. It's right. a satirical publication with heart is deceitful above all things. It's it's purporting to be a serious examination of uh, child abuse, right. and of neglect, and of, of a broken system. And everyone in the film, everything is a caricature. Mm-hmm. Um, having watched the film, I watched it again this morning. Um, which I never thought I'd have to rewatch the film. Right? How many times have you watched it? By this now? is my this second is just, time. Just this is my second, second time. time. Yeah, I could. See, yeah. yeah, This is this is enough for a one and done. Oh, I, I oh yeah, absolutely. It's sort of like Solo, uh, which is well, a, I've never seen and I've heard. And that's one. Of, do you feel like that is that that's an artfully done movie mm-hmm. from what I understand? Yeah, it's. it's but pure, it's also horrifying subject right. matter. And the first time I saw it, I was I was a little bit sanctimonious as mm-hmm. like a teenager and like a young adult. I think that um, you know one of my my great influences was Roger Ebert, and I think that Ebert's writing had a lot of influence on my my moral compass more okay. so than my own my own family probably. Um, but a, some of it was just pretense where I didn't really connect with certain things, and so I would adopt this kind of sanctimonious dismissal. And that's what happened the first time I saw Solo. I thought that it was just a repulsive film and. I saw no value in it. It was just filmed in this very sterile way. And Solo is, um, excuse me, um, you know, the good thing about audio is you can you can cut seamlessly. Yes. Um, and hopefully there's a there was just a jump cut. Um, <laughs> a- a- anyway, um, so 
uh, Solo is, is an adaptation of the Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom, but transposed to fascist Italy. Mm-hmm. And so it's about a bunch of fascists who kidnap um, uh, children, juveniles off the streets of, of uh, um, I don't know where, uh, I forget what, what, it's not, maybe Milan or whatever, it doesn't matter. And they hold them up in this villa and they force them to participate um, in, you know, sodomy and, and, and uh, what's, what's shit eating? Uh, coprophilia. Coprophagia. Uh, co- yeah, there's like coprophilia, coprophagia, yeah. coprophilia. There's a lot of um, words with the shit suffix, uh, prefix, sorry. Is there a shit suffix? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I think it's all prefixes when it's it comes to It's all prefixes, to shit. yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to work on a, on a shit suffix. That's going to be my next project. We need one. We yeah. got to make sure that there's balance when it comes to talking about I shit agree. I and agree. fetishes. Um, so it's a really repulsive movie to watch. It doesn't cut away. It's filmed in a very sterile manner. It's mm-hmm. all like symmetrical shots and long takes. And there's, I don't think, any musical score. Like a Wes Anderson torture porn. Right, without the without the uh, without the, the, the music yeah, and the Simon and Garfunkel, <laughs> right? Um, and so, I don't know. I, I know that it's a highly regarded film, and I was nineteen when I saw it, uh, and so it's. I've been meaning to revisit it um, in the decade since. And then about two years ago, American Cinematheque screened it at the Egyptian. Mm-hmm. I went to see it. It is a truly great film, and I understood what it was trying to do um, from this end of political awareness, which I didn't have to the same degree in 2002 when I last saw the film. Um, it doesn't mean I want to watch it again, but right. I, I did have an appreciation for it. I was afraid that was going to happen with Heart is Deceitful Above All Things, because I agree to come on here and talk about it. It's the film I despise more than any other, mm-hmm. and I, I haven't walked away with any additional degree of esteem for it, but watching it, perhaps because the, I, I was already desensitized to the film by having watched it once. It's like antibodies kind of appeared and and I didn't have the same level of disdain for it. Um, But certainly I don't admire anything about it. I think I understand maybe where um, she's coming from um, in that she connected with the material and I think she maybe thought she could could make something, some legitimate statement or art out of it. Uh, But she fails. You know, yeah, I, I still think that it's a, a very bad movie. Well, but it's the, a well-made film. That's the thing. And when people like ask, "Well, what's the worst movie you've ever seen?" There's this assumption of objectivity, right, embedded in that question. Like the worst movie I've ever seen. I don't know. Like Good Canada is 1945's The White Gorilla, which is a jungle adventure film that mostly just appropriates footage from a silent film and imposes a new story over it with like one of those like cut rate mid 40s like narrators that it's uh-huh. all monotone and it's just there's a film. It's a piece of shit, but it's inoffensive. It's inoffensive. And Heart is, Heart is Deceitful is a film that just deeply offended me. Right. Um, it didn't offend me to the same degree now. Um, I mean, a more offensive movie, I would argue, is, is Chaos, which is a movie that just it depicts a serial killer stalking women in the woods. There's a shot of him cutting a woman's nipple off. And there's Thanks. no, it's pure sadism. Um, with Heart is Deceitful, I, I think, I don't know, there's, there's a pretense to legitimacy in Chaos. And mm-hmm. I think there's the same pretense to legitimacy in Heart is Deceitful. Um, but I just, this time, I really, I mean, I was re- repulsed by what it's depicting. Right. Um, but with it now contextualized by the story of, of JT Leroy, there's actually a feature film released this year about JT Leroy with yeah, Laura back Dern. in January. I didn't I see think. it. I didn't see it yeah. either. I remember them talking about it on, right. uh, on I heard it on NPR. And it's a fascinating story. Mm-hmm. Um, it you know, sounds like it. And, and obviously, J, uh, Laura Albert did experience abuse and trauma, but there's also just there are other ethical problems with her. And this is a little bit of a, um, a, a peripheral discussion. I, I won't um, follow the thread too far. But, um, you know, in the film, in the documentary, there are all these recordings of phone calls that she had with her, her long distance therapist that she had with her um, celebrity friends. Courtney, there's, there's a phone call with, with Courtney Love where Courtney Love's like, um, I, I need to do this line of coke I just got. Hold on. And you hear like a long snort. And California is a two party consent state. And Mm -hmm. Lori Albert was living in San Francisco. Most of these people were also probably living in Southern California. There's phone calls with Billy Corgan, phone calls with Gus Van Sant, who lives in Portland, um, with uh, um, Tom Waits. And and so I, I got the impression that she did not request consent no probably making. not and and yet these these are just trotted out all throughout the documentary i mean half the documentaries are just half the documentary is just shots of um a cassette being played um and, and which and that's a trope that i'm getting a little tired of um but yeah. you know what, what what's it's popping up a lot what's the alternative um but i don't know there's just so much uh ugly ethical 
shit mm-hmm. around, you know, J- JT Leroy's story that, um, I-, I don't know, I think it still taints um, the works and and particularly the film. Right. Because there's this additional layer of, you know, Asia Argento's personality and which we now know, you know, and, and in the documentary, um, you know, she she's having sex with with JT Leroy, um, who is really just Savannah um Canoop. Savannah Canoop, yep. And so she had to have known at that point that this was not this was not really a man. Right. Um, but then of course afterwards she she adopted outrage once it became public. Right. Um so there's just on every level there's just shittiness and, and cynicism you know, just permeating this whole Absolutely, story. Yeah. yeah. Well, spe- I mean, it's. I think the 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 fact that I a hundred percent agree with you, especially on the caricature persona of everybody in this movie. Right. Every every single person in this movie does not feel like there is any kind of actual. There's no real actual yeah. depth to sure. any, to any character. Right. It just feels like, all right, let's throw up uh, the the worst white trash accent shifting kind right. of mom we can throw up. And, you know, it's funny because then she spends time in like where there's a reference to her spending time in like a boarding school in Italy. Yeah. Which I think was to account for any deviation in her accent because right. she's Italian. Yeah. Um, I mean, it doesn't really come out too much, but it really is still a caricature of a performance. Mm-hmm. And the the whole time it's. I remember when you told me about this movie mm-hmm. and you said you wanted to talk about it. Yeah. I read the plot uh-huh. on on Wikipedia and the first paragraph references I mean it's like the second sentence I think. It references yeah. Jeremy Renner's character raping Jimmy Bennett who's right. 7 years old as the character. Yeah. So it's like this happens this is around the time that Jerry Remmer, Jer- Jeremy Renner was in Z- right. Dahmer. So this is before yeah. she. This is before it was long before her locker. Oh, yeah. But he, I remember when it got to that actual scene in the movie, I was. It felt at that point just like, oh, okay, well, this is just another like a cardboard cutout of what mm. abuse looks like, and it's not really like there's no real depth to uh-huh. it. It's just it's just sadism for the yeah. sake of for the sake of shock uh-huh. and the sake of making you feel uncomfortable. Absolutely. And I'm totally fine with a movie that makes me feel uncomfortable, mm. but there has to be the the flip side to it where there has to actually be depth. It can't right. all just be surface level. Yeah. It can't be shallow. And yeah. this movie is just shallow. Right. One of my favorite movies for a long time. I, I've since gone through like a divorce with it, but it was <laughs> a movie called The Reflecting Skin. Uh, from 1991 with uh, Viggo Mortensen in a supporting role, but it's set in like um, the uh, the cornfields of uh, Idaho in the 1950s during like the Korean War. It's about okay. this, this small boy whose friends start turning up dead and they suspect his father because his father was once seen in, a, in a, a, an embrace with a young man. And, and, and you know, it's, but the movie is just one horror after another. Mm-hmm. But there's a beauty to it. There's a lyricism to it. Um, I, I don't think it's aged well. Um, but nonetheless, it's like I don't, I don't require hope. I don't require joy and happiness in every film I've seen. Mm-hmm. But I, I do like authenticity. And right. I like there to be a central thrust. Um, I think The Florida Project is a film that came to mind um, this morning upon rewatching Heart is Deceitful Above All Things. And I think it also depicts a similar um, parent-child relationship yeah. among a similar um, uh, subset of, of, you know, class. But it's it's handled in a way that's that's human. Right. There's humanity behind the camera. With Azia Arzento, that's not really evident. Right. I think a lot of what makes the Florida Project work, and this is something that that Ozzy Argento absolutely did not do because it felt more like a vanity project right. is telling the, the story from largely the viewpoint of the child yeah. and actually feeling like you are sure that child yeah. or with her the whole time. Right. You're not, I mean the, the basically the main character of the story of uh, the hardest to see above all things is Jeremiah is JT yeah. Leroy. Right. But I never felt like I was, in his head or or ever really like not aware of what was going mm-hmm. on in the way that I did watching the Florida project. Right. There's that scene I, that I will never forget in the Florida project when, uh, she's taking the bath and then the, the John comes in mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, I mean, you kind of knew it was going on, but you're in this girl's head the whole time. You have no idea. Right. And then the wall is pulled over 
and everything feels very uncomfortable. And but it felt like it came out of nowhere, even though I could see that that was probably what had been sure. going on. Yeah, and, and so with Heart is Deceitful, Jason Leroy would be he. I mean, before we knew that that it, he didn't exist, he worked out his demons and his trauma through writing. That's mm-hmm. the the salvation that he found. That's the tool that he discovered. And the film doesn't show any of that. Right. Nothing. You know, there was a movie in the '90s called Radio Flyer. Mm-hmm. Um, it. Do you remember this? Film? I don't. I, am, uh, I I don't think I've known a single film that you've named except for Solo and Florida yeah. Project. So I think the kid in I want to say the kid in Radio Flyer. I don't remember. I, I don't want to cheat and look at IMDb, but I think it was Joseph Mazzello, um, who was a child actor in the '90s uh, alongside like Joseph Gordon Levitt. Maybe okay. it was Joseph, Joseph Gordon Levitt, and I don't remember. I know Elijah Wood was in it. Okay. And uh, Lorraine Bracco was the mom. Okay. And it's a film about child abuse. It's a film about her. Uh, I don't know if it's the boy's dad. I think it's his stepdad, but he's just an abusive monster, and you never see his face. It's played by uh, Adam Baldwin, who's not one of the Baldwin brothers. Just um, another, just another just random a, Baldwin. Just a guy with a yeah. Uh, oh, he looks like he could be a Baldwin. That's that's the interesting thing. Maybe he secretly is, hmm. and he was excommunicated from the family. Baldwin I, I cousin. I don't know. Maybe he's a Baldwin cousin. <laughs> he's Baldwin adjacent, um, male pattern Baldwin, um, <laughs> and so um, it's it's a, it's just it's not a good movie, and it's a movie that uses child abuse as a to pre, to push buttons essentially mm-hmm. and that's an easy way to push buttons put show a child in jeopardy or an animal in jeopardy right. you know these are just these are easy cheap ways to get an audience reaction if you don't have a, a bigger agenda behind it like silent yeah. silent deadly night um yep. that's a film that you know i remember seeing it when i was a kid and um i rewatched it couple years ago and I have a, a an appreciation for bad movies now that I did not when I was like 10 right um, and um, it's just I could not enjoy it because it uses child abuse as a um, uh, just a narrative setup right in, in a way that does there's no real insight there it's just cheap psychology like psycho like the ending of psycho you know it, it's that's the that that is the stain on an otherwise perfect film because it it uses um, outmoded Freudian psychology that I think Norman Bates, he has like multiple personality disorder or something that's right. the, and just that whole scene that this exposition, um, it really dilutes the film and it's, it's, it's like pop psychology. And I think that's what, um, is evident in, um, uh, what the fuck movie was I just talking about? In, uh, uh, the one from Radio uh, Flyer. Radio Flyer, yes. Yeah, I feel like I was talking about. There's another one. After was it? I think it might have just been Radio Flyer. Okay, you're still on that one. Yeah, but um, there's well the whole thing. Silent Night, Deadly Night. That's right, Silent yes. Deadly Night. Yeah. So it it it's trying to draw a link between yeah, and certainly there's a link between abuse and and you know like uh, deviant behavior. But right. that, that movie's not really about deviant behavior. It's just a it's an exploitative slasher film. Right. Yeah. And it's so it's man, I have a a a the thing that I am the most curious about after hearing you talk at length about this movie by the way your cat is so sweet he's the best cat for for a podcast yeah. where we talk about how much we hate things my my girlfriend's cat loves me but it still bites and claws me and this cat just doesn't seem like he has the capacity nah he loves everybody the only right the only time he's upset is when i have to give him an allergy pill how, how old a cat is he he is three years old oh okay he's a good he's a good little he's guy. an old soul yeah he is but he's uh he's he's got it going on. He's finally getting a little fat pouch going on, so he's starting to lose his, his spread. youthful look. Exactly. Yeah. So h- how did you come across this movie mm-hmm. to begin with? What led you to watch it? And because it, it sounds like a movie that, based on your background mm-hmm. and based on the kinds of movies mm-hmm. that you sort of have acquired a yeah. taste for, mm-hmm. it sounds like a movie that you would not like. Mm-hmm. On the face of it, sure. So, what led you to even want to watch it? Well, I often watch movies that I don't like, um, oh, okay. or, or I often watch movies that I expect not to like. I, I don't know. I think that there's value to watching all sorts of movies. I mean, there's even value to watching a movie like this. True. I mean, I don't think that the movie took anything from me. Um, it, it certainly has given me something to talk about right. on this podcast. But um, I don't know. I think I was a, I was a lot more in. Uh, aware of and in the loop of what was coming out at the time and I was interested in, in these kind of smaller films and independent films and this looked like um, you know an edgy stylized which I mean it is um, it's definitely both of those yeah. things uh, and so I was just you know and also Ozzy Argento being the daughter of uh, Dario Argento um, so there, there are a number of things about the film that that made me curious as well as its soundtrack and uh, some of the people that appeared in it yeah um, it's edgy like open mic or comic edgy yeah it's edgy like um um, I don't know, like like a 
like a teen punk singer exposing himself at like a yeah. local venue or something. I, I don't know. It's the best metaphor I could come up with uh, it, on the fly. It's edgy um, with no actual. It doesn't. It, you can use edginess and in that kind of that vein. Right. You can use that. I think mm-hmm. in art to create something, but it's got to. You have to be able to paint with that brush in sure. a very specific way. Yeah. And I don't think that. That there's no it's I, I, it's hard yeah. to to say anything about this movie other than oh yeah well it's got it's definitely got style yeah and you know I think that if a different filmmaker had done it and if it just had been slightly different it may have worked I mean you know it, and also there are other people I think the film has a few defenders um, it, it just things resonate uh, and trigger different people differently. Mm-hmm. Like Roger Ebert is, is one of the vocal, or was long one of the vocal detractors of Blue Velvet. And his problem with Blue Velvet was the way that, well, there's one particular scene um, that um, offended him, I think more than any other, uh, any other where Isabella Rosalie's character is is nude and on the front lawn of like the police captain or something. And yeah. she's screaming and she has to be ushered inside. Mm-hmm. And his complaint is that, you know, it puts her in this super vulnerable um, uh, position and circumstance and then it cuts to like a kitschy joke. And so I, I think that he felt like that cheapened it. For me, I mean, I, I think with David Lynch, I think that for Ebert, he didn't really get David Lynch until Mulholland Drive. Right. And I don't know if he went back and reevaluated any of uh, his previous work. I, I, if he did, he certainly didn't write about it. But yeah. um, that's the way Lynch works. He, he transitions from extremes of feeling, um, but in a way that deepens each. Uh, and it's mm-hmm. funny to me that because like Ebert was also a, um, one, of, one of the, def- uh, you know, the um, um, champions of Last House on the Left back in like 1972 when it came out. He gave the film three and a half stars out of four. And, um, you know, it might seem inconsistent with his general um, distaste for rape revenge films. Mm-hmm. I Spin in Your Grave is probably his least, that's his least favorite film of all time. So for him to like Last House on the Left that much, right. that seems very discordant. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I mean, in his review, obviously he accounts for why he admires the film, but watching the film, I, I don't, I'm a Last House on the Left fan. I think it's crudely made and it does what he complains about Blue Velvet doing. It will cut from these harrowing scenes of rape and torture to like the Keystone cops with like the, the bumbling zany music. Mm-hmm. And it's so it's I don't know, there's an inconsistency there. Yet for some reason, that movie didn't offend him and Blue Velvet did. It's it's just so all, strange. It's, it's the fine details, I think, you know. Yeah. Is there a director that you think could have taken this like somebody that comes to mind is somebody mm-hmm. who could take this story and make it palatable and not just feel like a vanity project? No, it's a good question. Um because nobody, that's the thing. It's something that I... Todd Solons. He could do it. Yeah. Because happiness covers similar terrain, and it does it in a way that I think is more vulnerable to controversy because there's humor, mm-hmm. um, but there's insight and honesty and compassion in that film. Um, and I think that, you know, with this particular material... Um, I think that he would have made it, made it his own to a far greater degree than Ozzy Argento did. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Ozzy Argento is simply trying to interpret the material. Um, but that's just one filmmaker that comes to mind that handles stuff like that in a way that is, um, I don't know that I would describe it as tasteful, but artful. Right. It's it, What this film really needs is somebody who can make you actually care about the characters right. and what they're going through. Yeah. It was very hard for me to connect to anything in this movie mm-hmm. from it. It's, well, you don't empathize with anyone. It's hard. Yeah, I, I can't. It's it's hard to make a movie. And I, I can't imagine having to make a movie about child abuse and then making a movie about child abuse that you don't even feel empathy for the child, the child. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think with with characters like Aja Argento's character in that film, and it's, mm-hmm. she's a despicable character. You just want her to just die. Right. Um, the most challenging and noble thing you can do is make is give that character some humanity. Mm-hmm. Like villains that, you know, that was my problem with The Shape of Water. Michael Shannon's character, there is nothing redeeming about him. Right. So it's like it, there's no challenge um, to that character. You just hate that character. When the character dies, sorry for for spoiling it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but you're just like, oh, great. You know, that was that guy who's bad. And with, you know, a character like, so one of my favorite movies is Peeping Tom, mm-hmm. which is like, that That was released, I think, in 1960. Same year as Psycho. It was directed by Michael Powell, who was like one half of Powell Pressburger. Okay. Great filmmaking team in Britain. And he directed it solo, and it 
pretty much derailed his career. It was so scandalous in its violence and its depiction of violence against women. But it's a film about a serial killer who um, um, films his victims as he's killing them and watches it back in his you know apartment. And there's a woman who lives, I think, in his building, if I remember correctly, that he befriends. And there is this romantic tension between the two of them. And you begin to see the humanity in him. And she sees the humanity in him. And so it's like you're torn, even with like Norman Bates. I don't know that you necessarily see humanity in Norman Bates, but you see charm. And that's what struck me. Um, I hadn't seen I, Psycho like since I was a kid mm -hmm. when I, I think I finally at the new art screened it as a midnight movie and I was struck by how charming Norman, Norman Bates actually is because I always remembered Norman Bates as being creepy and socially awkward but he's actually very charming and he actually is a true psychopath in the way that he is able to control situations which makes that ending all the more false but you know there's that scene where he's trying to sink the car Mm -hmm. in the swamp and it gets stuck and you as the viewer you're kind of you're rooting for him it puts you in his right in his um vantage which is a very it's so important to have yeah. at least one moment of absolutely that levity where you're like yeah. oh okay i gotta I, yeah in this moment and hitchcock does the same thing in, in frenzy which is a later film he did also about a, a serial strangler um and and i mean that's that's the power of cinema is it's it's uh um, a capacity to make you empathize with characters. Mm -hmm. That's not its own only value. I mean, film's a visual medium, so it's like, sure, there's there's space for abstract uh, work as well. Right, yeah. But in commercial narrative storytelling, when you're telling stories about people, that's the most powerful thing I think a film can do is you empathize with someone that otherwise you wouldn't empathize with. Right. And that's why I think with, with you know, we're, we're particularly now in like this post Me Too um, age, it's, things are very black white and um, you know, there's not, and I think it's also a lot of like virtue signaling on social media, and certainly like the, the Me Too movement ultimately is is a positive thing, because yeah. it puts a spotlight on very bad behavior, so that it's 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 less tolerated. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think there's a lot of opportunism around it as well, and there's a lot of opportunism in I you know I largely work in true crime, and I see a lot of opportunism in the true crime sphere as well. People who purport to be victim advocates and justice crusaders, but they're just standing it for themselves. Oh, gotcha. Um, so, well, it's like, did you hear about the, I think it's a new David Mamet play that just came out. Uh, I didn't hear about it. So there's, I believe, I believe it's Mamet and mm. there's, uh, I know John Malkovich is in it. Yeah. And it's basically him cashing in mm. on the Me Too movement. Mamet? Mamet. Well, Mamet and Malkovich, they're both pretty far to the right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just weird when, like, an artist and an intellect like David Mamet um, becomes this kind of right-wing mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I can't wrap my head around. And Malkovich also seems like a fairly intellectual person. Yeah. So, but, yeah, I think Mamet has become kind of irrelevant because of his politics. Yeah. And this play, it sounds like, I mean, the person who, they, the the review that I read of it is... Written in a way that the person who wrote the review mm -hmm. did not clearly did not want to give this a good review, right. yeah, or uh, but had to figure how had to eloquently say how bad it was, right? And ultimately, the the it it feels like a cash grab. It feels right. like a, a the way to get people in the door. It's like, oh, we're gonna make the movie, where, we're we're gonna make the play where John Malkovich is Harvey. It's the Harvey Weinstein yeah. approximate, right? And it's self aware and funny, but sure. also it's about this relevant thing that's going on. Yeah. And over the course of the play, it just doesn't feel. There's no truth to it. Right. There's no honesty to yeah. it. It just feels like it's all done. Yeah. Just to be like. Hey, look what we look what we did. Yeah. Look and, what we started writing about yeah. a year and a half ago. And that kind of returns me to Aja Arzento in that, yeah, she was attacked by Weinstein. I don't doubt that, mm -hmm. and was a vocal, um, you know, um, uh, opponent. Uh, yeah, the lack of a better word that eludes me. Um, but she also probably sexually exploited this minor. That doesn't make her a, a hypocrite. And one thing doesn't cancel out the other. They right. can both coexist. And I think that where that's the problem associated with this kind of age of vir virtue signaling is that people don't, they're not really invested sometimes in the positions that they're taking. They're just taking a position on social media to be relevant. Right. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's this failure now to recognize gray. And there's a lot of gray and a lot of complexities in yeah. between the two extremes. And that's why a lot of people hated three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. And I think largely why I liked it, I mean, obviously I think it worked on a narrative level, but it, it's a movie that it, it, it opens, opens your perception to gray areas that, you know, it, it, particularly with like cops, I think that 
Yeah, cops are um, digging their own grave in terms of their con- their conduct and the fact that um, it, everything is filmed now with dash cams and body cams and people's cell phones. So there's, there are a lot more. I mean, this has been going on for uh, probably over a century, this kind of um, abuse of authority. Mm-hmm. We're living in an age now where everything is being documented. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's this, rightfully so, this wave of distrust and... Um, animus toward toward law enforcement and that that film three billboards depicts that kind of cop but then you start to realize that his intentions are are not bad it's just something's fucked up with his wiring and he's trying to be a good person right and then by the end of the film it's like you know you can't really take a position Mm -hmm. and i think it's important to remind people that you don't have to take a black white position yeah you Um, can exist in gray in a gray area yeah, because life is gray areas. Right. Life is not black and white. Mm-hmm. It's t- and it's tough to accept that too. Tough to talk about it too because you risk sound- you risk sounding like a me too dismisser right. or apologist, which I'm certainly not. Right, and me you know? either. Yeah, this is, but it's one of those things that as as the movement develops, mm-hmm. there is a, it's it's and, and and I think as any sort of social movement develops, where things sort of come to light, there's obviously a sliding scale of of what happens right different stories come out different incidents happen sure and it's i mean the Aji argento thing is it's it adds such a wrinkle that people are going to leap on yeah and it's almost it it, it does not make her behavior excusable right but it makes it it's in line yeah it makes sense that she would also be an abuser Right. And also her accuser yeah. prior prior to um, I don't know if I think it was after the incident, but prior to his coming out about it. Um, and I think prior to his getting the settlement he, and he got like a sizable set- settlement from her, mm-hmm. which is kind of a tacit admission of guilt. Right. Um, but I mean, he, he was, uh, I think, arrested where there's a restraining order against him for battering a, a girlfriend or someone that he dated. Um, so he, he too, um, is is possibly. Um, an abuser mm-hmm. and then you know it's like you consider the fact that he was a child actor and a lot of child actors are quite fucked up yeah um, and, and he was in this film that's an experience that may not have been a good formative experience for him right. so just the whole thing is just it, it just smells really bad I'm just glad you know? that Dylan and Cole Sprouse have walked away okay from yeah. this yeah from uh, the good the one you know what the one nice thing about this movie and it is also I mean it's also fucked up that she mm-hmm. did this in her own movie but not making whichever one of the Sprouse twins was playing her son at the time mm-hmm. have to seduce Marilyn Manson. Yeah. And she yeah. just did it herself. Yeah. It's definitely like fucked up from a narrative standpoint, but right. also like, okay, cool. You gave them one little bit of sure. Tiny bit of you protection. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting. I, I think there's, there's no nudity in the film. If I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, there's a shot in the parking lot where she flashes a, uh, like a store employee who follows her out thinking that she had shoplifted, right. but it's an overhead shot. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think that, um, if I really probed, there are worse, more offensive films out there. Yeah, I would say so. This is definitely not, this is not the worst movie I've seen, but it's definitely the movie that, I have disliked the most and also felt the worst about watching while I was watching it. Oh, yeah. You really want to shower after watching it. Yeah. And Scarlet Diva has similar imagery. I mean, there's just a shot of her drinking milk that turned my stomach. And I'm predisposed because I'm disgusted by milk. But (laughs) who is it? Milk's not milk. Yeah, this is from like a cow's tit. And, and, you know, I I don't know. It's always repulsed me since childhood. Um, But there's just a shot of her like on a toilet and it's like dirty and she's drinking milk. And I think it reminds me of a gummo. Um, Which I've heard, yeah, reading reviews of this movie, mm-hmm. a lot of people referenced Gummo. Yeah, and Gummo is a movie that in 1997 or whenever it came out, I, or 98, I, I hated. And there's like a long sequence with someone who's clearly developmentally disabled and it felt exploitative. Um, but, you know, it's like I also didn't like David Lynch at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't developed a taste for absurdism. And like Tim and Eric, I, I love their stuff, but there's mm-hmm. a real problematic element to that, too. Um, yeah. There's, there, I mean, it, it's inarguable that there are exploiting some of the people that they they parade um, absolutely it is and but you know it's like i don't know i i enjoy it so much that it's the kind of thing that i just i can't overlook it but i i push through it you know mm-hmm. and i i gummo is is celebrated in some circles and i've been wanting to rewatch that and the egyptian theater did a harmony corinne retrospective earlier this year and i saw it again i wasn't as offended by it but i still walked away not knowing how i should feel about it 
um, it's just a, it's a gray area in terms of, you know, like I know Tim and Eric, most of those people that they use are just delighted to be on the show. Right. I don't know that they really recognize the degree to which they're being kind of contextualized as ridiculous. Right. And I don't know if that makes it OK. I don't think it does. Um, but there are similar concerns in in Gummo, I think. Yeah. Man, I gotta watch more Harmony Corinne. I love Spring Breakers is one of my all time favorite. Spring movies. Breakers is, is great. Spring Breakers yeah. is probably like top three, top five for me on a consistent basis. But and I've never, I haven't seen any of his other work. And I think that also what makes me more receptive now to something like Gummo is movies and TV have become so sterile mm -hmm. and so rife with beautiful people that to see someone that's just like cast off Craigslist or a non-actor, like in Pasolini's movies, that's what Pasolini, one of the things he was largely known for was using non-professional actors, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Bresson as well. And I think that, you know, some of the Italian neorealists before Pasolini. So it's, 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 there's something refreshing about seeing even just a craggy face, you know, elderly performer. Um, it's just see not just this constant parade of of sterile otherworldly and quite frankly uninteresting beauty right but but realness yeah um, so I don't know it's um it's like John Waters so with John Waters I've never felt like he is exploitative of the people that he worked with because it felt like he embraced them and it was kind of this gang of like this underground you know countercultural um, uh, Troop. Yeah, like Island of Misfit Toys sort of vibes. And and he had this lateral relationship with them where he, whereas with like Tim and Eric, they really do feel like the empresarios, mm -hmm. the maestros, you know, of this kind of carnival sideshow. And there's this hierarchy on their, on their, um, on their show, on awesome, awesome Show, Great Job, where it's like they're, they're at the top of the, of the pyramid. And then there's the, um, the other celebrities that they use, like right. Patton Oswalt and John C. Uh, Riley. Right. Yeah. And Ray Weiss uh, and, and Will Forte. Yep. And then beneath them, it's like the has been celebrities like Peter Cetera. Yep. Um, Tom and, Skerritt. Yeah. And uh, Alan Thicke. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people, the kind of proles that they get off Craigslist. Right. You're David Liebehart, right. you're Richard Dunn's. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I have great affection for those people. And, um, you know, but one of my former girlfriends that turned me on to Tim, Tim and Eric and I, I'd been exposed to them prior and I just didn't take um, and then it did like around 2015 you know her argument was that well no David Liebehart is an outsider artist um, now come on that's not they're not just giving this outsider artist a platform they're exploiting him yeah, you know, and it's clear in the way that you can see them kind of interacting with him and getting him to do certain things. Like there's one one moment where he's like bowing, and they're like behind him, and they're like they're they're following suit, and it's just it's so, um, it just feels unkind. Yeah, you know, I get that. <laughs> Man, I feel uh, I feel so much smarter after talking to you during <laughs> well, this podcast. Paul. Thanks. What about what about you? Uh, I think I put Edgar to sleep. Edgar, Edgar, I think <laughs> is is he's taken all of the nap. all of the naps and yeah. all of the petting that we can give him. Well, hey, I I can't say I enjoyed watching this movie, but yeah. I am. I did I'm enjoy sorry. Our I chat. feel guilty subjecting you to it. You know what? <laughs> It, you learn something by watching yeah. a movie like this. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think it's a it's a movie that is obviously it's very there's a lot of complexity to the the sort of universe that surrounds the movie. Yeah, compared to the actual movie itself, which is very straightforward mm -hmm. and and just you know just bowling at a strike of abuse. But it's just I can't say I regretted watching this movie either. Yeah, it's definitely like. Okay, well, I have that one. What I have is it? Out of curiosity, out of curiosity, curiosity, if I can articulate this common fucking word, <laughs> what is one movie that you regret having watched that you wish a you ghost could un story. unwatch? What Did is you ever see that? No, a ghost story came out a couple of years ago. It's a movie by, oh man, uh, David Lowry. Okay, and he, uh, it's got Casey Affleck mm -hmm. and I believe. Oh, I remember this. Rumi Mara, yeah. yeah, and yeah. it's shot an Academy ratio, and it's <laughs> the whole premise of the movie is. Casey Affleck dies and then becomes a ghost and it's like a traditional mm -hmm. ghost like sheet eyes cut out and he haunts this house mm -hmm. and the movie takes place over the course of probably a hundred years or so mm -hmm. and I was just sitting there and I was I was not hooked by the movie but mm -hmm. I was watching it at the arc light so I felt mm -hmm. like I had to stick around and try right. to get my money's worth at least and there's this part in the, in the middle of the movie where the ghost, the so Rooney Mara has moved on from the death of her husband, Casey Affleck. Uh -huh. Ghost is hanging out in the house, and there's a party that's going on in the house with the new people who were there. Yeah. 
and there's this guy who is holding court mm-hmm. in the kitchen at this party. And he's basically just like, yeah, art's bullshit. And sometimes yeah. people make things and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter in the end. Mm-hmm. And I was watching that and I was like, this motherfucker's telling me what I'm supposed to think about this movie uh-huh. while I'm watching it. Yeah. I And I should walk out. Mm-hmm. But I checked my watch and it was more than halfway through the movie. It was yeah. like a 90 minute movie. I was like, Ugh, yeah, I'll stay and watch the rest of this. But that and it's like that. And it just like to have somebody on screen mm-hmm. lay out how I feel about the movie and also be taunting me for it. Yeah. Just didn't, I was just dis- disgusted by it. Right. I was like this, I cannot imagine yeah. that you are wasting my time and knowingly wasting my time. Yeah. And then also reading reviews of people who love that movie and they're like, Oh, it's a beautiful statement uh-huh. on, it's a beautiful meditation on love and yeah. loss. And I yeah. was like, you fucking idiots. Yeah. Get with the program. Yeah. Listen to what this man is telling you and that you guys are all wrong. Yeah. It's like the con man subtly yeah. telling you, you know, I'm conning you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when he slips up and sees the, and you see that there are more than one ball under the under the, the shell, yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, hey, Paul, thank you. I do sincerely thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was a this, pleasure. This is a, a really, really entertaining and interesting discussion. Yeah, I had fun. I uh I would want you know, you said you work in uh, some true crime stuff. Where can the listeners find your work and, and stuff you're involved in? Yeah, so I had worked on a book called I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara, who passed away in twenty sixteen. Um I was her researcher, I helped finish it, I contributed to it. I'm currently co executive producing the HBO docuseries. Mm. Um and um that's that's all I, I have to promote right now. Awesome. <laughs> so well, I, uh you can find me at diet j on twitter and instagram and jlightcomedy.com for show dates and if you like the podcast leave a rating and subscribe and tell a friend and uh and join the facebook group and we'll talk about more movies and stuff and, and you can you can find me on social media at the paul of haynes on twitter and instagram for those who are interested do you have a so. letterboxed profile i do have a letterbox profile we should we're gonna i'm gonna follow you on shell of snail this shell snail shell of snail shell of snail all one word awesome yeah. i'm also diet j on letterboxed but if you you guys need to get letterbox letterbox is cool letterbox is great yeah it's it's how i like document everything i see me too um sometimes i omit things because i'm embarrassed to have watched it yeah. so i i <laughs> wish i could with this podcast but i yeah. i leave nothing out Why not? Uh, This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. Thank you.